Hello. Uh, Professor, uh, great. I'll introduce you, Liz. Um, Bellinger is, is your artistic name, is that right? Um, yeah. Liz is affiliated with the Darug Nation of New South Wales and is a practicing visual artist, designer, researcher, and lecturer at Deakin University, Australia. Uh, so Bellinger's artwork integrated into her research explores solastalgia, the social, emotional and cultural loss experienced through environmental change, including human made destructive behaviours that impact upon our, our own health. So thank you very much, Liz. Thank you. I'll just share the screen. Thank you, everyone. Uh, good afternoon. Or um, first of all, I I say uh, warami, which means hello um, from uh, my language group. I'm sitting presently on Waramai lands, which is in the Port Stephens area of New South Wales. I first uh, wish to pay my respects and acknowledge elders past and present and and emerging. Um, in uh, where, where we're all uh, seated today. Um, this is, I just thought I, um, just for a bit of knowledge about my country, this is Darak country, um, surrounded by most, the most important sacred area, which is the river system, often known as the Hawkesbury River or uh, the Darug uh, uh, River. It's uh, Darug country is located just northwest of Sydney, um, and it spans out um, for saltwater as well as freshwater. So I've, in this presentation today, I thought I would have a look at, um, just present some of my own artwork, as well as some images that um, I've come across that are relevant. But most of the um, images are my own artwork and, um, I, I uh, often, even as an academic and researcher, I use visual literacies to tell the stories rather than um, within an academic Western language. So well, I thought I'd start off and, and talk about, you know, what is, what is art making and what is art? Because they're, they're from a Western and Aboriginal standpoint, they're very, very different. So Western language surrounds art, means it's visual, visually pleasing to look at, it's honoured in museums, and it tends to have some sort of uh, social status. We know that you know, people who are, um, are wealthy may put up an artwork and claim this is a, you know, the artist's name and it gives them some sort of social status. But um, when I was doing my PhD studies uh, five or six years ago, I wanted to look at, you know, what, what was the Aboriginal language um, associated with art? And I could not find any nation, Aboriginal nation, and for those that don't know, there's over 350 um, different language groups. There, there is no word for art. So I looked at my own language group and um, the closest translation was Bangawara, which means to make. And when you apply it, that word with the word na, it means to deeply see. So Bangawara na describes more what I'm talking about with artwork. So that the process of making also is very different because the process of making usually from an Aboriginal standpoint, is about developing that human nature engagement. And, and, one, one, and that's one of deep connections. And that's why, you know, the na is important to say after Bangalore. And it's very much guided by our human sensory experiences through the interplay of being on country. So you'll see, you know, and I'll describe in, in this presentation that a lot of the artworks are actually done on country and, and they're done by sitting on country or standing on country, lying on country. And our art making is, is about telling a story 
and it's central to our communication and it expresses feelings of country, the land, sea, and sky. The use of symbols and motives, you know, that's well known and, and of course, dot work, et cetera, or other forms of marking. We, so we, it's very well known in Aboriginal societies, um, but it's about, you know, these symbols have a great deal of cultural significance and they actually speak um, much more than, than words do. So when, when we talk about, you know, where, where did the art making start traditionally and, and the canvas, you know, the earth was the canvas and, uh, you know, with um, traditional healing practices that were performed on the sand, for instance, uh, there was a whole lot of symbol work that went into this and they're often very repetitious, but these are just a few images of some, some of the, um, uh, you know, artwork done on the earth's, earth's surface. And it's a really essential way of connecting with your hands, sensory touch, the feeling, feeling the earth's vibration. It's all about connecting and, and being as one. So this is a, um, um, uh, unusual view of one of their traditional um, healing uh, artworks that was performed in ceremony from um, on Darug country. It, you only see a portion of it because some of it is sacred, um, but um, I wanted to capture some of it to illustrate um, how, how artwork or how art making is really essential. So some of the processes here is that, um, and, and this is just from the direct community, is that the actual sands were heated. So uh, quite a large hole was dug with a fire and ceremony took, you know, um, days. There was no hurry and there was no fixed time. Once the, 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 the fire reached a certain point, the sands were covered over. And the actual patient or client or community member would lay across this area here and it was very warm. And you can you note that there's a lot of detail here in, you can see radiating lines, circular, circular forms and so forth. These are actually all natural pigments that were created on the earth's surface. So there's, there's um, ochres, there's grounds um, sandstone, which is pre prevalent along the, the Hawkesbury area river. Um, there's crushed berries to make a, a type of paste. It's mixed with different gums so it, that it's sticky and dries. And there's also a lot of um, three-dimensional involvement that happens in you know, traditional healing practices. You can see like a scattering of dark colours here. This is actually some of the um, traditional um, medicinal plants. And when they sit on these more heated sands, they actually have an aromatherapy type technique. And, and the smell is beautiful. You can imagine tea tree, um, eucalyptus oils, that sort of thing. So here's just a couple of images I thought that I would show on, on you know, how art making is, is performed on country and in country. So you've got here, you know, some ceremonial type artworks that are done on the earth's surface. Here's another example, but this is done on objects within country. It might be stone, but this particular one is, a, is about a tree. This, this may have originally been cut out for a shield or a, a, a canoe or a, um, that sort of thing. Um, but what's left behind is really important. And, and mud's placed over here to make sure that the, the tree continues to grow. So we don't take everything from, from country, we give back and we restore country, make sure the trees, et cetera, are restored. This is an you know, example of a cave art, which is on, on my country. This is about um, a woman's birthing cave. And it talks about, you know, the spirit of women and th this particular spirit is the protector of women. And of course, it's all done in ochres and uh, clays. 
And here you can see just the progression. Here we've got, you know, the contemporary artists working with, you know, Western canvases and acrylic paints or oils, etc. But you know, what's never changed is we often still sit on country and it's important to paint on country. I know as an artist, I um, get into a bit of trouble sometimes because the back of the canvas is usually, you know, dirty or muddy or, you know, people get upset about that. But to me, that's a really important aspect of um, authentic um, creating. So, here we have um, a couple of my artworks and I'm, I'm just going to touch on, you know, what is creative knowledge. And you, you often see, you know, uh, a lot of Aboriginal art and, and what is, it's an aerial view, view shot. You could pretend you're a bird flying over country, you could be in a, an aeroplane. And so you see a, an almost flat um, descriptive text of um, an area of country and and so therefore it relates to like reading a map and this is really important because the symbols or the you know the these uh, illustrations that you see throughout actually start to change their context because they're no longer just representative um, of a design they actually contain knowledge and teachings of where people sit where people go, who's allowed to go in certain places? What are places we don't go to? So very much, you know, Aboriginal art um, tells about stories. And they also highlight um, to a point, I like to try and highlight our ancestors journey because this is like a, um, a, a synchronizing effect where, you know, um, you, you have certain journey lines. Some Aboriginal groups may refer to them as trade routes or um, spiritual routes, that sort of thing. Um, but they're actually, you know, ancestor journey lines and it's retracing the knowledge that was handed down from one generation to the, to the other. This is thousands of years old. And, and many of the artwork is purposely simplified. I can remember when um, in the 70s where Aboriginal art took off and, you know, from, from internationally, yet Australian um, people still said it was so basic, it was like, it was childlike, it was so simplified. But it was simplified for a purpose because when you start walking on country and you remember this as a visual map, then you have this really effective memory tool that you recall. You always remember, you remember visual things. And when you understand their, their complexities in their symbols and so forth, you really understand, you know, what the, what the artwork is. It's actually, you know, a, a purposeful knowledge. So for example, here you'll see the river system. And here you'll see, you know, trails or tracks that climb up mountains or through ravines. Here you'll see that there's some areas that have a, a totally different patching or patterning or repetitious markings. They may be representative of water holes, where to find water, where to know, where to know and where to go. You'll see that there's animal markings throughout many of my artworks here that it indicates where some of the natural resources can be located. Let's have a look at another one. So all very different, but, um, and, and I use very different symbols um, depending on the place that I want to illustrate and the way I want to go about telling the story. Some of the colours have become really important. I love to use, you know, some of the purples because they, they portray a very spiritual side. I also like to do a lot of layering and under the, um, covered up under this, there are images and symbols that perhaps not are, are suitable for public viewing. Sometimes I will put up to, I think in one painting, I put up to 14 layers, which um, took a, a long time to dry, of course, but um, 
it, it um, gives that three dimensional effect. Another one of a river system using symbols and, and three dimensional aspects. This one's of a tidal system um, and, and it talks about the Hawkesbury River, it talks about the main routes to fish on. It also talks about the deep holes where to find good fish. So how can art making contribute to self um, knowledge? And this is something that I uh, spend a lot of time in is, is trying to connect people to be more aware of their sem uh, senses. And um, of course, in Western society, you're all aware of the, the five senses. We also have this too. And this is an illustration um, of the, the Darek seven senses. Here's it defined in a different way, still capturing the same, as you can see, the same concept. And we have the five senses here, smelling, touching, seeing, tasting, hearing. But we have also from direct knowledge, we also have two really, really important internal sensory guides. And they are the imaginary and the intuitive. So I don't use them as nouns because once you use them as nouns, it really change the, changes the rationale and, and uh, um, objective behind them. So intuitive, if it was just intuition, it would just be a, a, a feeling. But the intuitive relates to you know, gut feelings, whereas the imaginary, it's not about imagination. It's nothing to do with child's imagination. It's about um, invis envisaging dreams and so forth. So when we look at the um, two internal senses that I was just mentioning, ulna is the name of the gut feeling, our gut sensation. It's important, um, the most important area that we concentrate with, within traditional healing. We've all experienced that gut sensation, that body, bodily alert system that guides us. But more often than not, we choose to um, rationale. We choose to see it as, as, as logic, logic, logical reasoning. And, and so we often dismiss those emotional feelings. And we often later on perhaps regret not listening to our gut feelings thinking something's not quite right, feeling that, a warning signal, you might get a phone call and you think, I was just thinking about those, that person. You know, those, those interrelationships and those interconnectivities. So Nara is the word for the imaginary. That's through dreams. And um, how I could describe it best is that, you know, I do I often do really large canvases and I get quite involved and then I'll reach a point where I get stuck and I don't know where, where the next step's meant to be. So what I do is I, I, I often have a really vivid dream and I believe they come from my ancestors and they're guiding me to telling me what to do, where it's to go and, and um, solves my uh, a lot of my solutions. The rationale behind these two other senses is that it, logically we sense, we feel things before we think of things. And that's, that's the most important aspect. Hence, it is not the mind that drives creativity, but the deep connections we have with our body. And, and when we see country as part of ourself, where we see the lands as an extension of ourselves, we're able to feel and hear and, 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 and sense its pain. The senses provide a deep awareness of also the past, the present, and they offer future guidance. When we view things as always interconnected. So, this is the symbol. I thought I'd throw this in. This is the symbol of Ulna, which, you know, as I said, is that gut feeling. And this is used in traditional healing, healing practices. And, and it's by putting it in an anti clockwise, it actually aligns and corresponds 
with the this movement of, of the sun, the shadows, the wave directions, all of that happened in the southern hemisphere on direct country. And, and you know, as, as I've pointed out here, it's it's also known in is in research that this anti-clockwise movement is dominates in the southern hemisphere. So this type of healing is re re um, synchronizing with the natural world. And this is where we can all learn uh, from is the importance of connecting to country, feeling a belonging. We need to resynchronize our bodies um, as, a, as a way to heal ourselves and heal country. Uh, these are just some quick narratives. I'm just aware of the time, that's all. Um, feel, feel free, um, Tian, to um, let me know what, how the time's going. Yeah, we are getting uh, very short of time with uh, what time is the session ending? Uh, we were hoping to have a panel discussion. Yeah, um, we, we've kind of uh, starting to run into the panel discussion, which is a little bit okay, because we did start the session after lunch a little bit later. So okay. I would say a couple of minutes would be lovely. Okay. Yep, sure. So I'll just quickly mention, um, so this is this is a, a large scale painting I did, and it was a replica of, um, you know, uh, often the viewer says it looks pretty, it's like a woven blanket, um, but it's actually um, talking or trying to communicate about how since colonization we've become to tighten up we've formed this rigidity where we've cut up pieces of land put them in parceled we've done we've done crop production that has all been destructive behaviors the dark space is the hole or the wound from mining etc so i'm just going to go into the the last um, leave you with this last one because metaphors I just want to mention how metaphors are great construct in telling stories of country and they offer a really multi-sensory experience so this is an artwork that I did it's probably about six foot by four foot um, and it's you know full of fish um, and I, I like to sometimes sit near a painting when I'm having an exhibition to listen to the stories that the viewer describes and what they think the painting's about. So some say it's really serene, some say it's peaceful, um, others say, you know, I'm not sure what it's about. Um, but there's always something um, uh, that I spend time with telling children, it's a bit like the Where's Wally? And uh, this painting is actually about one fish, one little fish going in the opposite direction. And it's a story of um, an elder of mine who's continually struggling against the rest of the tide um, to stand up for Aboriginal rights, deaths in custody, looking after country and so forth. So I'm going to end it there and um, thank everyone very much um, for the opportunity to present. Laura.